We're continuing our conversation on conflict and conflict resolution styles, and we're particularly focusing on the Western way of handling conflict. And we have talked about the five ways in which Westerners tend to handle conflict, uh, either giving in and accommodating, or another style to withdraw and avoid conflict. Uh, sometimes compromise is the best way forward where each side gives up a little in order to get what's most important for them. Uh, problem solving, care fronting, or collaboration is another style of handling conflict in which uh, both sides win and get what they want through creative conversation. And then uh, the other one is the win-lose or the competing style of handling conflict where one person uh, tries to win and uh, therefore the other person w must lose. And if that person takes that style on a, a frequent basis, then they uh, have this reputation of always needing to win in any kind of conflict situation. And then we looked at assumptions that were uh, embedded or inherent in each of these styles. And in each of these styles, uh, one can use them if the conditions are right. So if the situation is of this nature, this style will work best in order to manage the conflict so it doesn't become a problem, it doesn't cause alienation or anger or defensiveness. What I do want to do, however, in this session is to talk about a way of handling conflict that isn't on this chart, but it actually is a, a variation of this style. And what I want to do then is to talk about the win-lose person and to uh, see what happens if you're around the win-lose person over a period of time. Remember that in the win-lose position, one person has a strong need always to win. And whoever the other person is must uh, lose or walk away from the situation. I grew up in a small church where um, a couple of the men that I knew were very strongly opinionated. They always felt that it was important that they have the right perspective and they believed that their opinions and their suggestions and their ideas were always right, were always best. Uh, we would call them egocentric in some ways, my way is the best way, but then they would argue for these positions and debate. And one of the things uh, is, uh, one of the questions that might be important to ask is how do people try to win over others? Well, sometimes you can use guilt. Say, well, you're not so smart, you know, or you didn't have this kind of education, or you were wrong. Remember when you were wrong? Well, the assumption is if you were wrong back there, now you're wrong again. Or sometimes we use silence. Uh, that's often used by women, I think, more than men, but men can use it as well. But silence, and I'm not going to talk to you until you agree with me, until you give in, you do what I want to do. If you're big and strong, you can use physical force and force something on the other person. Sometimes we try to intimidate people. Uh, uh, lording it over them and, and uh, using fear tactics. Sometimes we can threaten them. Um, we might threaten with children by saying, you know, I'm not going to let you come home or I'm going to send you away to live somewhere else. So we use these threatening tactics or however it works out in those situations. Uh, sometimes we even use the Bible we say, well, you know, I prayed this morning and this is what God told me. That should end the conversation. You know, God gets the final word, doesn't he? If God told you, who can argue with that? That's sort of the final big argument for winning. Um, when people would sometimes do that with me, I would say, how did you know it was God speaking to you and not heartburn? You know, maybe you had too much pizza last night and you mistake God's word for stomach problems. Um, so we have these ways of intimidating. 
At any rate, uh, this particular father in our church was, um, his children were the, about the same age as I was. He had uh, two girls and, um, and a son. And the two girls were uh, roughly uh, my age. They were lovely young ladies. They always came to Sunday school with their Sunday school work done. Their Bible verses were memorized. Uh, they were always well-groomed. They always had right answers. They were always polite. Uh, they were always at Sunday school, church, youth club, midweek prayer meeting, Bible study. Uh, just really model Christians in many ways. And so I sometimes heard the father talk about how his girls were going to marry pastors or missionaries. So he had already determined that their future in that way. Um, when it came time for them, uh, as they grew well into their teen years, 16, 17, to date, uh, he refused to let them date boys, but they could date in groups. So if there were five or six of you going out together, that would be okay. They had to come home earlier than most of the others, however, uh, and they could only be with Christians in that evening. If there were any non-Christians in the group, they couldn't go. So life was pretty legislated, pretty rigid, pretty prescribed. Now this father also took this position of win-lose. And so in all of life, he, he was right. They were wrong. His ideas were better than their ideas. If there was any discussion about how soon they should be home, his way was right, theirs was wrong. So in everything, um, he prevailed. And in, when you're in that situation, and that goes on for years and years and years now, even into your young adult years of 16, 17, and 18, that starts to have an effect on you. And the effect is that you have what psychologists call low ego strength. Uh, or low self-esteem. Or some sense of uh, worthlessness. So you feel worthless. You're never right. You can't be right. And pretty soon you just feel like, like uh, there's no way that your opinion, your ideas are going to be good or good enough. Not for your, this important person in your life, this father. And, and the mother was sort of the quiet, silent partner in this whole thing. And I watched this situation for quite a long time. The girls, however, seemed to me to be reasonably healthy. And um, eventually, they came to uh, high school graduation. The older one was taller and quite thin and not quite as attractive as the other one, but still a lovely person. And my parents and I went to her graduation, and she got her certificate and everything. And there was celebration. And I remember her parents saying to her, her father saying to her, now uh, come home because we have a party for you. And she says, I'll be home soon. Well, we went to the place and we waited and we waited and we waited. She didn't come. So we drove up to the school and nobody was there. The town was small, so we drove around because maybe she was with friends or something. Couldn't find her. They eventually, uh, late in the day then, maybe three, four hours late after the graduation, uh, they went into her room and realized that her suitcases were gone. She had packed her bags. She had uh, put them somewhere the night before. She had actually put them in her boyfriend's car. Her boyfriend was a non-Christian. He was not only a non-Christian, but he was known as a person who used drugs, a person who used alcohol, and lived a very reckless very abandoned, raucous kind of life. They had forbid her to see him, but now she's gone. 
and they had to file a report with the police and the police said well we can only do something after 24 hours by that time they were in another state because she went willingly and they could see that she had planned it uh, the police could do nothing it took a year and six months before they found her and she was willing to speak with them. But they finally made contact. But they had no reason to believe that anything bad had happened to her. But in this time, she had made a whole different kind of life, abandoned all of her Christian faith, and was living a pretty uh, 60s kind of life. And the 60s in America were pretty, pretty bad. Well, um, I remember him, the father, saying months later in church, uh, we think the devil got a hold of her, and it was just more than we could handle. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if it was only the devil that contributed to this problem. Well, the other young girl was graduating a year later. She was a wonderful, attractive young lady, again, more quiet than her older sister. And um, everybody knew she was going to be the perfect wife, the perfect Christian, the perfect young lady, the perfect everything. She, she just seemed to have everything all together, um, properly dressed, articulate, uh, smart, etc. And nobody uh, ever dreamed that anything would go wrong. Again, we were invited to the graduation. Again, um, she was going to come home. Everybody, nobody suspected a thing. And lo and behold, the same situation. She had run away with her boyfriend after graduation. They were, they were gone uh, and they were the parents were just shocked because she had a whole nother life that was something her parents never knew anything about. And now they're certain that Satan has been particularly attacking their family and, and destroying their family. And I remember the father again saying this, and he, he says, we don't know how the devil got a hold of her, but he did. And then I said to myself, maybe it's not only the devil that's at work here. Maybe there are other things that are contributing. And of course, you catch a sense of where I'm going. Well, um, what happens now is that in these situations when people are attacking you day after day, year after year, telling you in one form or another in all different situations that you're no good. You don't have good ideas, you never have good, you can't make wise decisions, uh, you're, you're worthless. That's the message that comes across. The father never said that, but it was always the subtext when saying, no, your ideas aren't quite good enough, here's the, what you're going to do. This is a better idea. This is what I'm telling you to do. This is wisdom. This is the better way. And when you hear that, you then say, my way is never good enough, therefore I'm worthless. However, there's something inside all of us that rebels. It says, no, I'm not worthless. I'm, I'm a human being. I, I reject that. But if you reject your father, what's going to happen? He's going to get tougher. It's going to get worse. It's going to be more rigid, more inflexible. And so, as they say, your arms are too short to box with God, or your arms are too short to box with your father, too. So what happens then is you take a passive-aggressive approach. And in the passive-aggressive approach, you give the appearance that you're doing what people want you to do. You go through the day and you say, yes, Father, and you do this. And sometimes you make a little remark and your father says, now that's not a good thing to say. You know, and you say, oh, yes, I'm sorry. But that remark at least gives you some sense that you can express yourself. But in the older girl did some of that some of the time, but the younger girl never did. She was just always this perfect young lady. And so you give the appearance that you are being what the authority figure wants you to be. But underneath, you're fighting. Underneath, there's anger and resentment. So 
you're fighting back in order to protect your ego and you, you are angry because somebody is attacking you, attacking your ego, attacking your personhood, eroding, destroying your dignity as a human being. There is nothing more sensitive than for somebody to dehumanize you. Your parents probably remember that from communist days. Some of us remember it from parenting days. Some of, it re some of us remember from a controlling supervisor or boss. My wife wants to write a book. Leaders I have known from hell. Now here's what's really interesting about that book. She has all these people who want to volunteer to write a chapter. When she tells him this, she wants to write this book, of course, she's saying it in jest, but uh, she has all these people I want to write. So you take a passive-aggressive approach, passive at the surface, but aggressive beneath the surface. And so this anger is there, and it continues, and, and it develops into resentment. And your resentment is towards the person who's causing you this terrible feeling this feeling that you're worthless and you have to fight that feeling, this feeling that I have no sense of self-worth, self-esteem, and that I have a right to a, to a voice, I have a right to an opinion, and I have a right to be heard. And when everybody's, de well, when your authority figures are denying that, that's a very painful thing, and so you want to fight back. But if you fight back openly, you get crushed, you get smashed, you get oppressed. So the resentment comes. Now, with the resentment, there's fear. So you have this idea that you need to fight for your dignity, but the fear is that if you fight openly, things will get worse. Uh, and if, uh, that, that actually the situation now will get worse uh, if you fight openly. So now you have to fight beneath the surface, and you are now deceptive. You're deceiving the authority figure because it's your only survival strategy. It's all you can do to somehow hold your dignity and, and live reasonably well at the same time. Well, eventually, so now this passive-aggressive approach is taken because of this situation. Eventually you come to a point of power. I think it was Igor that says that much of the conflict that comes is because of the need for power and control. You are powerless, and that's part of the whole situation here, to do anything about it. You can't fire your father. You can't dismiss him, you can't send him away, so you're powerless. You can't change his habits or his way of communication, so you're powerless. And that makes things difficult. So the only way you can fight is beneath the surface, going underground. And all the time you're fighting, but all the time you're pretending that you're this good person, that the authority figure wants. The point of power is, in America at least, when you graduate from high school. Now you can get, go into the military, you can get a job, you can, you can usually have a driver's license about a year before you graduate. Uh, so graduation now is your point at which you become more of an independent person. And in this situation then your point of power allows you to have open rebellion. And the open rebellion is done in such a way to inflict as much pain as possible on the person who was hurting you, robbing you of your dignity and your sense of self-worth. This is happening a lot in American society. I think it's happening a lot in many Western, Eastern cultures as well, Eastern European cultures. Uh, and Western European cultures. And if we understand it, maybe we can change and help. So now you adopt a lifestyle 
which is exactly the opposite of the authority figure so that you can hurt them as much as possible. And these two girls who are such wonderful human beings turned into these monsters of revenge based on their anger and their resentment. And now they have to inflict this pain on their father. I'll tell you the rest of the story. The younger girl went, I believe, was two years before contacting her parents. And then, uh, and then when they did communicate, they communicated only with the mother. Um, three years ago, the father uh, was stricken with cancer. He was in the hospital. The mother communicated with the daughters that their father was going to die soon. They didn't come to the hospital. They didn't visit him. My parents visited him because my dad and this man, uh, this other father, were good friends. And so he dies. There's a funeral. They call the girls again, please come. Your father has died. We would like to have you at the funeral. The family can be together. They refused to come, even to their father's funeral. I asked my mom about that, and she said that was true. So even the, the pain continues. The need to have some kind of revenge continues. Lack of forgiveness, by the way. No forgiveness here. Sometimes the pain is so great it's very hard to forgive. But the only way, the only antidote to pain and anger is forgiveness. But they're not willing yet. Now I want to make two more points. And uh, one is, some of you may work with youth, some of you may know youth, some of you may know of this kind of situation. What we need are people who intervene. I would say that often God intervenes. Not all the time. I don't know why God doesn't intervene. But in my own life, I had a situation that was somewhat similar to this. And God brought one or two people alongside me. And essentially they said in a, in a variety of ways, not directly, but in being there, in talking with me, in inviting me to certain events, or being at a sporting event where I was playing football or basketball, I would hear their voice and they would be there cheering for me. And God intervened through certain people and alleviated the anger and the resentment, you see. Uh, for some reason, these children had at least one person like that, but maybe that was not enough, I don't know. Maybe the father was considerably more harsh, more rigid, more dogmatic. I don't know what it was. But both of them chose a very destructive path to hurt their father. But they only hurt themselves in the final analysis. Um, so here they were, they were oppressed. And rather, and then in their oppression, they rose up in rebellion and they themselves became oppressors towards their father. Isn't it interesting that the oppressed often rise up and become worse oppressors? Uh, rather than finding liberation, they kept themselves in bondage. Now they're in a different kind of bondage, a bondage of sort of a reckless, worthless kind of life. I'm not sure. Maybe they've straightened out. Maybe things have gone well for them. Uh, their lives are pretty much unknown to, to my family. Now, in closing, I want to give you one more thing, and this, this is helpful for all of us as we communicate with people and as we try to avoid conflict situations. Uh, a researcher was looking at how people respond to situations. This was research done in the West, so things may be a little bit different here in Russia, but you can decide how much of it carries over and doesn't. But the researcher found that in people responding to situations, that if you responded one way to a situation 40% of the time or more, it would equal 100%. Okay? 
So this father responded to situations in a win situation by saying, uh, no, your way isn't good enough, my way is better. Your idea, yes, that's okay, that's a good idea, but here's a better idea, my idea. Uh, yes, your opinion, I, I hear what you're saying, but it's, it's not sufficient, here's a better opinion. When you respond to people that way, 40% of the time or more, people perceive you as responding 100% of the time that way. And so they say, you always or you never. Uh, then you come back and say, no, it's not always. No, it's not never. Remember two days ago? You know, and then you have an exception. But the fact is, it feels that way. So when we respond, and the, the most frequent response in the West, at least, in, in America, is the evaluative response. Right and wrong, good or bad, agree or disagree. So when you have an evaluative response, and that's pretty much all the father gave to his children, they realized that he was evaluating them everything and they were always lesser. They were always wrong. They were always defective. They never measured up. And that is a very painful way to live under authority. And so they took this passive aggressive approach and that is a variation of this withdrawing or avoidance. It looks like you're avoiding conflict, but in fact, underneath, you're fighting. But you're fighting for your dignity and your sense of worth and your sense of value as a human being. A place on this earth, a voice that's respected, a voice that's heard, a voice that has some intelligence and reason to it. And so we have to replace that, we have to first of all recognize that that evaluative response is not very good. And actually, we can respond 40% of the time by giving in. And they'll perceive that you give in 100% of the time. And so then when you do draw a line in the sand, create a boundary, they say, oh, you don't mean it because 40% of the time you don't mean it or more. But this is the most damaging one where we're constantly in an evaluative relationship pointing out where you're wrong, where you're defective, where my way is better, my way is smarter, my way makes more sense. This is particularly important with our children, but also with our spouse, with our relatives, our friends, our roommates, our colleagues at work, etc. Here's a conflict situation that is so highly explosive. Now the passive aggressive person is the most difficult one to deal with because they're very good at avoiding conflict. They say, oh, you misunderstood. No, you don't, you don't get it. You don't under, you, 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 I didn't mean that. And so they can avoid conflict. So you, it's, um, it takes a lot of conversation. And what they're doing is that they're responding to you out of fear because if you have some authority over their life, they'll try to avoid the appearance that they're fighting you and they get very good, very clever at, at doing that. So the passive-aggressive approach tends to be rather common in many of our situations in, in the West, and it's very difficult to deal with that person, but it's a response to a certain kind of authority figure, certain kind of um, position. Sasha? I have a question. Uh, the fact that the father uh, blamed Satan and uh, even after this happened, it shows that he couldn't hold a uh, like critical view of himself. So he's always right even after this happened, he couldn't find. But my question is, uh, what made him this way? Like uh, why he became that way? Like what was the cause that uh, formed his uh, h him uh, to behave this way in the first place, mm -hmm. that he's always right, and what what might be the causes that uh, form people in such a way that they become such people? I'm I'm guessing that it was his home environment as well, and what happens is if in your home environment that's the way things are, but you turn out pretty good, and he did, he uh, had a good job. Uh, he he had a, lived in a, not a big home, but a nice enough home. 
Um, he had a good family. So he says, you know, what was done to me, uh, look how I turned out. I turned out fine. I'm a good man. I'm, I'm healthy. I have, you know, a car and job and everything. And then you do the same thing to your children, believing that. But you see, this was also the 60s. Everybody was um, wanting their own way, strong sense of independence. But I think it's not just the 60s. It's within us all to want to be respected, to want to be valued, to be encouraged, to be right sometimes. If you're always wrong, that's a very hard thing to handle. So I think it was probably his own home that brought that forth. And then uh, sometimes maybe the teaching is that you're the man of the house, you're always right, you know, and some, some people teach that. And so everybody must do exactly what you say. And so they kind of give you permission to be dictator. That's not the way we honor people. That's not the way we respect people. I don't, even, I don't think that's biblical. But anyway, Vitaly. Uh, just a simple question. You said he had a son. And what happens with his son? His son became a clone of the father. I have to be careful now because um, the mother is still living. The children are still living. Um, the son became a youth pastor, studied, became a youth pastor, and in seven years was in, I think, five, four or five different churches, I think five. So a little bit of time and then he leaves, a little bit of time and then he leaves. And the son then, when people start to ask, why do you leave so quickly after one year or two years? Why so quickly? He says, well, they're not, they're not interested in spiritual things. They're not interested in being serious about God. So just like the father, he found a place to blame. And he wasn't responsible himself. And after the fifth job, I think seven, seven, eight years, uh, he goes back and he works in the same factory that his father had worked in and runs his home like his father ran his home. So he became a clone of his father. So that partially answers your question, Sasha. Where does it come from? Some people will rebel, but some people will just say, yes, this is the way it's supposed to be, and they'll continue on the tradition. Now, what I don't know is what has happened to the son's children, you know, the grandchildren of this father. I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know. It's a very sad story. But it's, it's important to me because there was a time in my life when I was responding to my children in evaluative ways and doing some of the same things that this father was doing because I wanted them to do the right thing. I wanted them to make good decisions. I didn't want them to make mistakes. And so I began to control their life. And, and my motives were good, but it's almost like the monkey. And my, the distance between me and my boys who were 12, 13, 14 at the time was growing. And I came across this research and I said, that's me. That's my problem. That's what's happening here. This is why information gives us options to do a better job. It gives us the opportunity to correct the mistakes that we're making. It gives us a chance to be a, have a better future together. And to this day, a lot of it had to do around the music they were listening to. And so I began, for six weeks, I never used an evaluative response with my children. Not one negative remark, not one. Didn't matter what they do, I'd stopped it, six weeks. And I thought, okay, this is nonsense. This isn't working at all because there's still the tension, you see. And I remember coming upstairs, to, they were on, bedrooms were on the second floor coming upstairs, and they heard me, you know, because, and they said, hey, Dad, come on in here. We want you to hear this music. And they invited me into their world. They had never done that before. And they said, listen to this. And they were so happy and so proud. And I listened. I said, that's great, you guys. You know, <laughs> what, what are the words? <laughs> they played it for me. I still couldn't understand the words. So they gave me the words, and it was beautiful, good words. Uh, there was a Christian song that they were, 
singing. And of course, I grew up believing that if you don't understand the words, the music is not good, it's evil, it's of the devil, etc. My dad used to say, straight from the pits of hell. You know, if he doesn't understand the words, then it's bad. And that was what I carried forth as well. That's the way I, and, uh, but I had, from that time on, I've had a wonderful relationship with my boys. But I had to change. Information you can use to manipulate other people, or you can use information to change yourself. Not to change others, but to change yourself. And when you change, they will change as well. So information gives us options to do better. Options that give us liberty and freedom. Options that all help us to move towards the goals and the values and the kind of life and the kind of relationships that all of us want. We'll continue this thought in the next session. Thank you.